Well, I've got good news and I've got bad news as well. So the good news is that House and Senate Democrats have introduced legislation to increase the federal minimum wage from $7.25 per hour to $15 per hour. This is really phenomenal news considering we haven't seen a federal increase to the minimum wage since 2009. It's been 12 years almost. So this is long overdue. The bad news, however, is that this isn't actually going to fully take effect until 2025, which is bad because we're not actually getting to a point where workers are getting a living wage. Now, at face value, I think that it's smart the way that Democrats constructed this legislation because they're making it so that way gradually the minimum wage goes up each year. Now, they're doing this so that way they don't hurt small businesses and the economy, and the way that it's going to work is if this passes, it'll increase immediately to $9.50 per hour, and then $11 an hour the following year, then $12.50 an hour by 2023, $14 an hour by 2024, and finally we'll arrive at $15 an hour by 2025. Now, it makes sense the way that they're doing this because what they're doing is they're modeling this after Seattle, which is a case study that proves how effective and successful, you know, cities can be and how great it can be for workers if we actually do increase the federal minimum wage. The issue is that modeling it after Seattle, while, you know, it, it sounds good on paper, they did this, Seattle did this in 2012, uh, whereas we're doing this now in 2021, which is a very different story. So if Democrats actually want to solve the problem long term, then I could digest this easier if they raised it to $20 an hour, for example, over a longer period of time, or they kept this same exact time frame and they just attached everything after 2026 to inflation. So, it, you know, the minimum wage would automatically increase every single year to keep up with inflation, but they're not doing that. So the ask here isn't great. And especially considering what workers are owed, this really, it doesn't seem sufficient to me. Now, having said that though, it's better than nothing, right? It is better than nothing. Even if it doesn't take effect until 2025, a 2019 study by the Economic Policy Institute found that even if the minimum wage wasn't increased until 2025, that would lift 33 million workers' wages. On the other hand, though, this study was conducted pre-COVID, so the economic situation that workers are in currently is far different than it was back then. So we don't necessarily know that it will have the same effect, but overall, we know that the aggregate effect that this will have will be positive. The question rather is, will this be enough? Now we'll get to some of the criticisms of raising the minimum wage that we see from conservatives and some liberals, but uh, here's why I think that Democrats need to fight for more. First of all, the federal living wage, as of 2020 at least, was $16.54 per hour for a family of four. So if a family of four was not making this, they are not considered to be making a living wage. And if you look at productivity, well, if the minimum wage kept up with productivity, currently the minimum wage would be $24 an hour. So on one hand, it is positive that they're going to raise the federal minimum wage. The issue, however, is that it's still not good enough and assuming that we don't see another minimum wage increase for more than a decade, we're always going to be in this perpetual state of trying to play catch up always trying to gradually increase the minimum wage because you don't want to hurt the economy. Whereas what we should be looking to is a long-term solution where again, you tie the minimum wage federally to inflation or a living wage because the goal ultimately is to get closer to a living wage. And while this certainly helps with that, it objectively speaking, it gets us closer to a living wage. Still, what we need is for people to actually have purchasing power in America. And long term, what I really want leftists uh, to think about is what do we actually want? Like, how do we solve this problem permanently? How do we actually empower workers? And, uh, you know, when you think about this, it's really hard to still be a capitalist. It's why I am not a capitalist, because in this exploitative capitalist system that we live in, workers only have barely enough to get by. And as it is currently, it looks like that's always going to be the case. Whereas if workers actually owned the means of production, things would be a lot different. So this article by Forbes from 2014, it shows that if Apple were to be converted into a worker cooperative, the lowest salary that workers would have would be above $400,000 
per year. So in this capitalist system that we have, workers produce wealth, but they don't get to enjoy the fruits of their labor. And what's sad is that even a minimum wage increase, knowing that that's insufficient at $15 an hour by 2025, you still see folks who are against it. You see these boomer memes on Facebook. Not all boomers believe this, but you know, you mostly see it from your conservative aunts and uncles where they'll share like this image of a self-order menu at McDonald's and they'll say, oh, well, you want $15 an hour, peasant? Well, meet your new replacement a robot. And the folks who claim to be capitalists don't know anything about capitalism because that is an inevitability. If it were cheaper by tomorrow for every single fast food restaurant and multi-billion dollar company to replace their workers with robots, they're going to do that immediately because they don't care about workers. They care about increasing profits. So they're not just going to like out of spite replace their workers with robots because they ask for a wage increase or unions. That's not the way that capitalism works. It's all about profits. And so the minute that robots becomes a cheaper solution to labor, that's what these companies are going to opt for. Now, the minimum wage in Seattle, there was a lot of fear mongering about this because at first preliminary studies showed that there was kind of a negative effect for workers. While you know, the studies showed that some workers benefited, what businesses did in actuality was in response to the minimum wage being increased, they just reduced their workers' hours. So overall, they kind of like weaselly get out of paying their workers more. You just cut their hours. So they're still making the same poverty wages. But overall, when you look at more studies collectively, Seattle proved why the minimum wage overall is a net benefit for workers. So in 2019, Matthew Zetlin of Vox explained, generally those business owners who threaten to leave Seattle, this is one of the main uh, fear-mongering tactics that we saw, uh, to evade the new wage, haven't been following through. Surprise, surprise. The restaurant industry moans and groans about minimum wage increase, but the Seattle newspaper every month has a story about 40 new restaurants opening, said Jennifer Romich, a University of Washington social policy researcher. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the number of jobs in restaurants and bars in the Seattle area has grown from 134,000 to 158,000 since 2015. Surveying employers, Romich and other researchers found the most common response to the wage increase was to raise prices or fiddle with workers' hours, and a very small percentage were thinking about withdrawing or leaving the city. So that's one of the complaints about the minimum wage. But they continue, the story for employees is much more varied. The minimum wage for large employers jumped from $11 to $13 an hour from 2015 to 2016. The economists observed the impact of the hike in 2017 and found it had dramatic effects on the low-wage workforce and employment. Not all of them were good. They found that the policy reduced hours worked in low-wage jobs by 6 to 7%, while hourly wages in such jobs increased by 3%. Consequently, total payroll for such jobs decreased. That means the total amount that employers paid to workers was less with the new minimum wage in place than projected payroll if the policy hadn't gone into effect. The data, researcher Mark C. Long explained, suggested a tipping point between $11 and $13 an hour when it comes to less tenable to keep work in the city. Critics were quick to point out that this likely wasn't solely due to the minimum wage policy. Seattle's labor market continued to heat up during that period, reducing the number of low-wage jobs compared to high-wage jobs overall. But... A year later, the team published another paper that complicated their findings. They looked at the same time period and same wage increase, but this time broke down the actual take-home pay of workers. They found that workers who were already employed at the low end of the wage scale in Seattle enjoyed significantly more rapid hourly wage growth following wage increases in 2015 and 2016. Those who were already working more hours before the wage increase saw essentially all of the earnings increases, while the workers who had fewer hours saw their hours go down, but wages go up enough so that their overall earnings didn't really change. They theorized that a slowdown in new hiring for low-wage jobs could explain their earlier findings that overall payroll had gone down. Ultimately, workers already employed either saw their take-home pay go up or stay roughly the same while working fewer hours. So overall, what the data tells us is that raising the minimum wage produces a net positive. Either wages increase, predictably, or if employers respond by cutting hours, well, the increase in their wage makes up 
for the uh, the loss of hours. So overall, it's a net positive. Raising wages of workers is good, and I would argue that you know it's good for the economy overall because when poor people and working class people have more money, have more purchasing power, what do they do? They stimulate the economy. We go buy Xboxes. We go to the movies when there's not a pandemic. But when rich people have money, they hoard that wealth in bank accounts, usually offshore so it's tax-free. So trickle-down economics has been a colossal failure, and I think that it's obvious that the answer is making sure that normal working-class people have more money. That's good for everyone, including these large businesses, like it or not, because, you know, these capitalists, they want to exploit their workers, but nobody can buy the products produced by capitalists' workers if they don't actually have money in the first place. So overall, this is a really good thing. I'm glad that Democrats are raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour, and they're not backing down to $12 an hour, which is kind of what I thought. So in a way, I'm pleasantly surprised. But at the same time, we have to push for a permanent solution so that way workers aren't always behind and making less than a living wage. And that means you've got to tie this to inflation or at least account for the likelihood that we're not going to see another federal minimum wage increase for more than a decade, assuming Democrats lose control in 2022 and 2024. Overall, this is good, but we've got to push for more. Always ask for more because workers need this. Right now, we are in an unprecedented crisis in America, or at least the crisis that we haven't seen since, you know, 100 years. So now is the time to go big or go home. And I'm glad that Democrats are doing this, but in my opinion, it is not good enough, not anywhere near good enough, and we've got to push them to do better.